Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of This Round is on Me. So I just got back from a wonderful few days in Goa and I have to say I'm so impressed with the F&B scene in this beach town. You know, young chefs are doing amazing things with short menus and small spaces and you know, it was just such a delight to be able to enjoy this um in what's normally the down season in the city and even the cocktail scene. I mean, just incredible. So, you know, if you follow me on Instagram, check out uh, my Goa highlights or um my last few posts and you'll see um some of the recommendations I have. In fact, today we're here to celebrate someone who also started with an adorable small space which is now a brand marking the opening of its 100th store. If you haven't tried brownies from Theobroma, you've missed out on one of India's most popular desserts. But did you know the recipe for that brownie was born in a small kolaba kitchen at the request of a neighbor of the founders, Kainaz Mesman Harchandrai and Tina Mesman Wikes. Join us after a quick break when we have Kainaz on the show. Kainaz, welcome to the show. It's so good to have you here. Thank you, Gauri. It's good to be here. And listen, congratulations, <laughs> hundred stores. I can't even believe that. I feel like it makes me feel really old because I still remember your Kolaba store that was like the go-to place. And um, you know, wow, that is some crazy growth. And uh, you know. transitioning from being sort of everybody's favorite neighborhood bakery and patisserie to now this this uh, <laughs> massive pan india brand and you know congratulations Thanks. that is huge how does it feel thank you it feels good uh, although i don't focus too much on it but uh, my focus remains what it was when we started the one store So um, what what was <laughs> you know what was the vision for Theo Broma when you started what 2004 right 2004 yeah. we opened our first store and literally that was the vision open a small neighborhood cafe uh, which was sort of like an extension of the home and we wanted to make things that we like to eat ourselves and what was also at that point of time largely available only in uh, five star hotels mm-hmm. we wanted to bring it out onto the high streets and uh, literally we just wanted one neighborhood cafe and our first thought was like we've got four tables how are we going to fill it out <laughs> for the whole day <laughs> uh because we are paying rent and stuff and i think 18 years on i think very little has changed in terms of our uh, what we do and who we are so we we wanted to we still make things that we like to eat mm-hmm. but we also now include things that our guests like to eat so <laughs> sure and you so, know i'm going to yeah. sort of ask you a little bit about that as we go along and, and yeah. you know it sounds so much like us as well right like yes. i can't today imagine having sort of going out of bombay even let alone sort of uh, you know pan india and uh, i totally resonate with that and i think a lot of owner sort of driven businesses are really about fulfilling a personal need a personal passion and just yes. doing it and you know you don't necessarily start out with this crazy five year plan or anything and um, Absolutely. but of course things change along the way but you know before we get into that and mm. what it's like running sort of a business of the scale that you do today tell us some of the initial challenges because i believe before you even started with that one cafe you were baking out of your home kitchen and that's kind of how it started and then you sort of transition into a high street a space more professional yeah kitchen. so what were the challenges and what sort of made you take that plunge because i know one thing is that in the lockdown so many people have started doing that right like baking or cooking out of home and you know um they may have kind of hit it off because they have an amazing product and now they want to maybe scale and but it is a pretty scary landscape to yeah. get into you know a physical restaurant or cafe or retail store etc so what were um your challenges and how did you make that decision to you know take the plunge so i think uh, when we started the only thing we knew was to make cakes and we didn't know, know anything else about the retail business also we didn't have much of a point of reference there mm-hmm. was Uh, really, very little out there at that point of time, and I think 
that in itself was uh, the biggest challenge because we were totally unprepared for the retail business as such. Uh, there was one incident which happened very early on in our first week. We had made a cake for the store. We had done, at that point, it was very fancy. We had done all these chocolate fans and covered the whole thing in chocolate fans. And there was a guest that walked in and uh, she just looked at the cake and said, oh my God, that's such an ugly cake. <laughs> and uh, my mom was Who needs standing. social media when you have <laughs> real life? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, broadcast yeah. in real life. And my mom was standing behind her and she heard that. And I think she was, she had been so exhausted from the week that was she just burst out crying oh, no. right there. And we were, we were like, what happened? <laughs> How did it go from, you know, lines outside the door to my mother sitting in the middle Howling. of the store, bawling away. But I think over the years, what has happened is there were different problems at different stages of the business and that continues. So I think even today, there are problems. Mm -hmm. They are just different in nature yeah. from what happened and what happened when we started. And I think uh, one of the biggest things that we've learned is just to be able to deal with the problems in a more efficient way. Um, and the challenges were whether, I think for me personally, it was my first challenge was to become a better human being. Honestly, uh, I didn't know how to be a boss. I was a 23 year old kid when I started. And uh, I have to say, I was a terrible boss when we started because I didn't know how to do, mm. do anything. I mean, my we were I came from a five-star kitchen culture where, you know, to prove that you were a cool chef, uh, you know, I had mm. to scream and shout and, you know, uh, use profanity and, you know, that kind of culture to handling a whole team which, uh, you know, had different requirements. They... They needed inspiration. They had money problems. They had life problems. You know, I just did not know how to deal with that. But what and was it that uh, made you kind of, uh, at what point did you know to move out of the home and into a professional setup? So uh, I think uh, we just took it as it came. We were in a home environment. Our first kitchen was, you know, my grandmother's apartment. And it wasn't <laughs> effective as a mm. kitchen. And the needs of the business changed, were changing very rapidly. So everything that happened and everything that we learned happened on the job. Yeah. I didn't know anything before starting out. If we just, whatever situation was thrown at us, we had to learn how to deal with it. Yeah, no, I can vouch so, for that. I think that's still true yeah, today to is, a large extent. It is yeah. true. So uh, I think that's how we took it on. We just took whatever challenge came our way head on. And uh, when the time came where we couldn't handle the uh, domestic or a, a residential apartment as a business, yeah. we had to move out and we didn't even know how to build a professional kitchen. Mm -hmm. You know, we had to start and yeah. made many mistakes in that too. Yeah, so, oh, this sounds a little too familiar. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I, I guess the home. thing is that, you know, you if you, at least from my experience, it would be that if you have a little bit of, you know, saving kept aside and you're willing to risk it and potentially let it come down to zero, I think take that plunge, right? That's what both of our sort of experience would say to people who are, you know, maybe at that cusp and trying to, and maybe a little nervous about taking that plunge. If you do have, I mean, I wouldn't say put everything that you have yeah. into it, but if you have something sort of kept aside and you're willing to take that risk, because it is a bit of a risk, but of course, and this is the auditor and me speaking where, you know, I'm completely risk averse. But at the same time, I think you have to, you know, if you if you are confident about your product and you have seen sort of success with it at a home scale, um, you know, taking that plunge into sort of the next step is is not yeah, a bad I, I think thing. Everything is it's different for different people, Gauri. Honestly, there are people who run fabulous home businesses. Mm -hmm. And it's really up to them. They have to decide whether they want to scale or not. And thing is that I always tell everybody, your intention should never be to scale. Your intention should be to create a valuable business. Whether that is at scale or not is up to you. If uh, So how would you define so, what's a valuable business? Is it about being where able you to... Where you have a good solid product where you're able to run things efficiently. Now, isn't it better to have a small business that is profitable rather than 
having a big business that's loss that is loss making. Absolutely. Just to say that I have, say, 100 stores mm -hmm. for the sake of argument, but I'm making zero profit. Yeah. But I mean, at least I'm the kind of person that would rather say I have one store but I make a lot of profit. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I, I can't agree with you so more on that. Yeah. I think I think it's different for different people. If you are able to scale and you're scaling for the right reasons. Like I, I come across uh, young entrepreneurs, you know, pretty much once a week that try and come and pitch an idea and say, oh, you know what? I have this business idea. The product will happen. I don't know that I'll figure out how to do it. But I want to open in Bombay. I want to open in Baroda. I want to open here. I want to... And I'm like, hang on, yeah. <laughs> slow down, at least start the one in your home state or your home city, wherever you're living and do it properly. And at least prove to yourself yeah. that you'll be before wanting funding before, you know, uh, this, uh, from the first day, there are people that want funding. Yeah, You know, your priorities have to be right. And I think scale is not for everybody. But if you have that ambition, then do it and do it well. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree with you that you have to have the product right before anything else and and no better sort of testing ground than your home to start with if yes, that absolutely. works and it's possible, um, you know, before you put a lot of money down behind it. So, you know, you've talked extensively in the past about family support. Uh, you've had being able to get the room off the ground. And um, I obviously work with my husband and now I believe you do too, although he wasn't obviously part of Theobroma. Six um, years now. Yes. Yeah, from the start. But um, it's funny because when uh, Jay and I talked about getting into the business together, my family actually said it would be a recipe for disaster, pardon the pun, but, yeah. you know, that it really wasn't. And intuitively, that didn't make sense to me because mm -hmm. I thought, you know, who better to trust when you're 100%. getting something off the ground than your spouse yeah. in, in, for the most part. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it seems to be the sort of impression. And now, obviously, 12 years on, I understand that if it's not a very solid relationship, it can lead to a lot of friction because that's the nature of business. And it's sometimes hard to keep, you know, work and home separate. You had not just, well, now your husband, but before that you had your parents yes. and your sister yes. um, being a part of it. So that was literally like all all in. <laughs> what was your experience of working with family and today now with your husband being part of it as well? You know, I think Theobroma initially became a success because it was a family venture. As a family, we are very different people. Even between Nihal and I, our personalities are very different. But I think we are... All, you know, of course, there's the trust factor, like you mentioned, which we have explicit trust in each other. And your family always has your back, whether they are your spouse or, uh, you know, your parents. I think that was very clear on from the beginning. So even though we may at times and quite often differ in our experiences, our aspirations are same for the business. You know, the trust is there. And you know that really when it comes down to it, your family is going to be there to support you. And I think Theobroma, when it started out, because it was a family venture and each of us had uh, certain qualities that we brought together, that was the reason why we had a very strong foundation in the business. And uh, that's what really helped us. At least I look at it that way. Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree again that I think it's not just about let me get cheap labor or free labor yeah. <laughs> around the yeah. family, yeah. but really about what do each of the individuals bring to Correct. the vision and more importantly that the vision is aligned. And I think that's where sometimes, you know, you hear about big family separations and yeah. business and things and it's possibly when the vision sort of uh, diverges, yeah. I guess. I think that's what I would say is that, you know, if both people have the same goal for the business, for the brand, etc. You may have different paths to reach that. Yeah. And that's where sometimes, you know, opinions differ and approach differs. Right. But um, yeah, like you said, you know, if there's trust and an aligned vision, it usually can work out. And many fights and conversations. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, and, and it's something I also learned is that, you know, to separate roles and responsibilities early on. It's again, something right. that no one told me and uh, we sort of realized that about I would say six months into our business that it's important to have that and while we may ask each other's opinions on things certain sort of responsibilities uh, lie with 
you know, a particular person and they get the final say after maybe hearing everyone out. 100%. Um, and that has really been the, the key thing. And, you know, if we've ever kind of digressed from that, we've come back to reminding ourselves of that. And, you know, would you say that it's a similar so kind exactly. of... So exactly. So jobs and responsibilities uh, have to be clearly defined and there shouldn't be any overlap uh, except when it comes to really the the core values of the business, which have to be aligned for everybody. And, uh, you know, I can't stress enough the trust factor, which, uh, you know, so whether not everyone has the privilege of having a family that has all the diverse uh, sort of uh, functions, functions yeah. within the family to, to be able to put out a good solid business from the onset. But even if you don't have your family, you have to surround yourself with a core set of people, group of people. Now, whether that's family, relatives, friends, spouses, partners, whatever it is, that complement your set of abilities and as well as want go in the same direction, right? It's exactly like a marriage, yeah. right? You have to choose your core group and the people that you trust the most to achieve your common goal. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about this more because mm -hmm. obviously with scale and the growth that you've seen over the last few years, that core group has grown and, you know, it's now gone well, well beyond family. So we'll talk about that soon. But before that, I also want to ask you, you know, you are a bunch of women founders between your mom and your sister and you and of course your dad won't forget him. I'm sure <laughs> he had something <laughs> he did. No, <laughs> to no, do no, with it. Did, yeah. um, but you know, and today Nihal works, your husband yes. works with you as well. Yeah. Do you feel that you as women, I mean, I know you've never been a man to be able to speak from the other side, but do you feel that you brought something specific to the business as, you know, being a sort of women run? I wouldn't distinguish it between a man and woman, I think, you know, we all, as I said, had different abilities in the business. So it was very clear. My my sister, like you, is an auditor. She's a child accountant, but she was also, early on, she was the strategist for the business. She devised the business plan because I certainly had no ability to make a business plan when we started. And uh, my father, he started many businesses in his life. So he, it was very easy for him to sort of, uh, you know, he gave us the initial investment to start the business. Mm -hmm. At 23, I didn't have the business, but he basically backed my mom and my idea of starting a business, which was, in fact, an extension of the home business that my mom had successfully run on her own right. for the last 20 years whilst I was you know, growing up. Growing up. But so, I mean, you know, you said that you you get approached by a lot of, um, you know, budding entrepreneurs who have great yes. ideas. Uh, do you ever sort of hear of them having challenges because they're of course. women versus maybe ah, that way. men getting into Yes, uh, sometimes, yes, of course, there are a lot of uh, challenges that because I think the F&B industry as a whole, generally, globally is a very male-centric industry, Absolutely. right? Because, it, you know, uh, it's it's hard work. It's physically, it's very hard work. The hours are unsociable. You know, there, there is no time for a balanced life, at least in the initial part of your career. And it's heavy lifting in the kitchen and, uh, you know, operation intensive. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, generally, I do find that it's difficult in operations to encourage women entrepreneurs and the, the brave women that actually take on this, this responsibility do sacrifice a lot. Mm -hmm. And also the world at large around them in the F&B industry. So whether you look at government agencies or landlords or, you know, everything around you is is very geared towards the male. Uh, the thing. I, I still get emails that say Mr. Kainas, dear Mr. Kainas, you know, because it's just assumed that, uh, you know, it is a male that's heading the business. So I do feel in that sense that the women do have greater challenges. Even in the kitchen, you're surrounded largely by chefs who are male rather than female. Although I must say it is changing since the time that I've started to now in the last two decades. I've seen massive changes in the industry. There are more women who are daring to become chefs, uh, taking on uh, you know entrepreneurial projects. 
and um, you know are able to run their businesses successfully yeah no and i think um, a lot of them are inspired by you know people like you who where they see that you've done it successfully and so it is possible of course it's um, possible yeah you know in my experience hiring and retention has been a major pain point <laughs> and i'm sort of very small percentage of the scale that you are so i can only guess that it's exponential in your case but it is something that makes us slow to scale and you know ours is of course a little bit more of a brick and mortar you know larger proposition than than um, service the, the big element of service exactly. in restaurants exactly and you know i think it's definitely you know in the 12 years that we've been around you know where we're sort of growing at a much more sort of manageable pace for us mm-hmm. and i know that the people part of it is a big aspect of that so at the rate that you've scaled how have you managed this aspect of the business so i think that's a moving target honestly because uh, first of all i think as an industry we have to accept that we are a high churn industry you know attrition rate is somewhere close to 50% which is crazy right so that's one thing i think the acceptance i think and as a company we've progressed from you know literally being in desperation and hiring anyone that walked through our doors to clearly defining who we are as a company what we do as a company and what we want to achieve as a company as a whole and therefore to achieve that what are the qualities human qualities that we require in the people at different levels so i think once that we were able to sort of document and accept and understand i think we became better at recruiting and so we were able to recruit then the challenge i think came <laughs> is retention because again it's a high churn industry so you know investing in training which one of my biggest things was i didn't invest we didn't invest as a company enough in training in the early years and so investing in training retention and also engaging with your team on a level that is not only about work you know taking an effort to getting to know your team of course it's not possible when you have high scale it's not possible to do that with every single employee but if the culture filters down from the top right. then all your managers are able to do that and uh, i still think that as a company we still have a long way to go for that but it's a start yeah. we've made a start and i think uh, that has really helped in the kind of people that uh, we choose to represent our company i think uh, you know you really hit the nail on the head and we're actually going through that right now i mean how many employees does uh, theoroma have a few thousand wow okay <laughs> no. i have like a few hundred but i'm <laughs> kind okay. of going yeah. through no no yeah. i mean uh, it's just that yeah. it's interesting cuz we're going through that as well and yes. I think um culture is a very key word here and that's something that we're trying to actually just put down you know it's something that has been in maybe j in my head mm-hmm. and maybe not even aligned always or it's just we've gone about things in a very sort of haphazard yeah, yeah like you know yeah, absolutely like we are uh, firefighting yeah, and you know not 100%. sort of really having that macro view on on the the overall company and the business in terms of people right and um i think that is something that we're really at a point where it needs to be defined the whole landscape that we're working in today at least in the f&b industry mm-hmm. has changed dramatically right and right. it will continue to do so and if you i think don't stop and pay attention to this aspect you know the people war is only going to get bigger is my understanding and so i think it's really important like you said that as early as possible to start thinking about these things even if you're not in a place to implement it immediately but you know like you said learning and development and just values which are communicated and not just in your head and that right. you assume everybody just understands yeah. exactly so that's really interesting that you know you're you've been through something similar but how do you handle this high sort of turnover of people right how i mean i've seen it impact our business and especially with ours which is a very service oriented business that you know people do build our guests do build a rapport with our team and it's really sort of very critical to the experience how in your business i mean which i'm also assuming is a lot about consistency and mm-hmm. 
how do you handle that high turnover of people as far as the impact on your day-to-day business? So I think it's just acceptance, uh, first and foremost, of the fact that people are going to go. But if people are going to switch, does that mean you will not invest in their training? Does that mean you will not invest in their well-being? Does that mean you will not, you know, look out for their financial security or whatever the other aspects are with coming, being, you know, sort of solid company? And I think uh, the answer to all of that is, you know, even though they will leave, you still have to do these things because ultimately they are the ones that are growing your company and growing your business. Yes, you you founded the business and you did your job and you had to and you continue to do your work, which has its place. But, you know, you have to invest in your employees and you have to invest in recruiting them. Mm-hmm. Personally, I feel. Yeah. I feel that's the only way. No, really. I, I think you're right that, you know, while they're with you, give it all you've got. They are yours. Yeah, yeah you exactly. Know? No, that's great messaging. The business was managed, like we discussed, by family before you appointed a CEO. Mm-hmm. We've also been through, again, something similar recently where it's the first time we're bringing in sort of an outside professional into the business. And that's been wrapped with challenges because... You know, you're used to working in a certain way. You guys understand each other. You don't have to say everything out. How was that transition for you with bringing in, you know, an outsider into a family-run business? So it is painful. It's also very rewarding. Uh, Again, I think the basic understanding, uh, first of all, when you bring someone outside is how do you align their interests with yours? Uh, because uh, it's not just about giving them a good salary or a market salary, right? For example, our first CEO that we had, there was no way we could even afford his salary Mm -hmm. or his market salary, right? Uh, But once we identified him as the right person for the business, the way we did it was we we aligned his interest with ours by parting with equity. I think uh, that itself is a big thing, right? Uh, It's not easy to part with uh, your your equity that you've built, uh, you know. uh, But that was the only way that we thought was right. And I think we made the right decision because we continue to do the same with our second CEO as well. Um, So that was uh, genuinely that. The second step, I think, was accepting that when someone new comes into the fold of this close-knit, tightly guarded you know, business, there is going to be change. And that change has to be, you have to accept that and understand that you've brought them on for a reason. Let them do their job. If you constantly interfere with their vision, you have to first understand what is in their head. If, If they have a vision for the company, is that aligned with your vision? If it is, then great then let them do that because they know how to do that. That's what you've brought them on for. As promoters, generally, because we feel we operate from a passionate mindset, we think, you know, I've built this business, I've done this, I've done that. So I know it better than anyone else. So I only will teach everybody what to do. It doesn't work that way. Every person has their strengths and weaknesses and a limited ability to do things. Um, And that is why you are seeking professional help from the outside. So first is the acceptance that you need professional help. And then once that professional help comes on board, you need to let them do their job. And and it wasn't easy for us. Uh, We made many mistakes with our CEOs in terms of interference, in terms of, you know, trying to force them to do something that, that they didn't want to do or they didn't think it was right, that was right. And these were painful decisions. They were painful processes to go through. But like every other problem, I think we learned a lot from them. And today we have a CEO, I feel, who genuinely has the liberty to be a good leader, independent and take decisions for the good of the company, independent of what the family thinks. So it was easier the second time round, for sure. It was easier the second time round because we learned... Mm, uh, so much from uh, the first and had we let the first CEO also, you know, do what he wanted to do. Also, it would have been 
different. Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, you have to accept your limitations and uh, trust the person you are bringing in yeah. um, enough to do. I think the the big thing is accepting that change because it's, um, like you said, you've been doing things a certain way and they've worked to a large extent, mm-hmm. which is why you're where you are. And then when someone sort of starts digressing from that, it's not because it's um, wrong. It's just that it's different from what you've been doing and it didn't necessarily come to you innately when you were doing things. So it's very hard. And I think another important aspect for us has been that firstly accepting it ourselves, but then also being able to communicate that there will be change with people who've been with you for, you know, a long time and gotten used to, again, like you working in a certain way and then someone else coming Mm -hmm. and maybe like messing with that a little bit. Um, And I think that, again, really comes down to, you know, our leadership as founders in terms of how we communicate this to the rest of the team as to prepare them for something like this, right? But you, at some point a few years ago, decided to bring in uh, private equity investment. So did you bring a CEO in before that? Or yes, was it as we part had of... our first CEO was before private equity investment. And how much earlier? Or was it sort of... Uh, I think a couple of years earlier. Wow, okay. Uh, and it was three, then something that you, you know, felt that this was... I mean, at like what point did you bring, decide that you wanted to bring in a CEO? So, so uh, uh, when, you know, when the fam... We were about four stores uh, when we felt that the family just couldn't do it anymore. Um, we were exhausted, uh, you know, working seven days a week. And I think uh, the big uh, sort of tube light moment came was when we understood that we all have limitations. Even even with the full force of the family doing different things, we still had limitations. And, and to grow the business, we needed professional help. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that acceptance, uh, the day we accepted that, I think uh, a lot of our lives became uh, much more clearer. And then, uh, you know, that's when we got our first professional CEO on board. And I think it was just wonderful to have him because he came from from a place which he understood how to build uh, lasting businesses. And so he actually was really responsible for getting us ready for private equity. So the first step was to uh, not get us ready. Um, and the second step and the more important step was to get the business, business ready. I think every business, like I was telling you before we started the podcast, that today, even before people have opened their first store, they want private equity funding. It doesn't work that way. You know, uh, there, there is a reason Funding will be available from many different places, but getting it in a sensible manner, understanding that it's a responsibility is not there to fund your lifestyle. It's there to to help your business. Um, so you know those kind of things we learned. I didn't know it was it was a very scary time for me getting private equity because again, you know, inherently I'm not a person that likes scale mm. so uh, losing that, control basically yeah, yeah. you know I, I like things tight and cozy and small and so it was uh, very scary because suddenly I was a chef but I was suddenly I had to do all this documentation and processes and process control and you know uh, look at numbers and inventory and stuff like that which um, you know it was hard for me so for me uh, whilst it was a very scary time of my life, but it was also a time where I learned a lot. And uh, so it made it very exciting mm. at the same time. And uh, then once you get that and you're, you're, you have to be able to prove to the investors there is a demand for your product, that you're building a business which is going to be resilient, you know, slow and steady. It has to be at the pace that... Uh, you know, the investors have to be really like your true partners. Mm-hmm. It's it's not that you, you know, pick up, get funding from anywhere and just use it. You know, it's that, only going to a bank. It's yeah, literally, there's you're, a reason you're for one. You're choosing a yeah. different kind of partner. You're choosing a partner that is, who's ambitious, has the same ambitions as you, but also wants to build the same kind of company you want to build. For us, it was important that we found private equity partners that did share those visions with us 
and so you know it did take us a while but we so found just, the right I mean, partner so again to kind of track this yeah. in terms of growth um you know you said that you felt the need to bring in a ceo when you were like forced for um stores yeah. large uh at, and then it was about 3 or 4 years before you raised private equity so uh, what what um what growth did you see in those 3 4 years before you were able to uh, go out i think we grew to about 20 stores I think we opened our first store in Delhi uh, right before we got private equity. Okay. So, so you already had about 20 stores in Bombay I, I before so, that. Yeah. Wow. And my and numbers are kind of messy. <laughs> <crazy, so. laughs> I think this is a good point to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to this round is on me. When you say that you know you wanted to obviously it was important for the whoever you brought on as your sort of business financial partner um in the form of private equity for their their vision to be aligned with your sort of the, the growth strategies to be aligned did you have something in mind when you went to them and did that change at all you know after having a sort of you know after your meetings with potential investors as to whether you were on the right path or whether they had something different which you then kind of modified your vision accordingly so i think uh, yes because uh, you know we had heard all these horror stories about private equity uh, you know once uh, of companies and especially fnb companies going completely bust once they gotten private equity and you know things like that and then so it was a very scary time as i said but i think uh, our first ceo he really uh, prepared us quite well on what to expect and what uh, what to look out for and so when we went in we, we you know even though there were so many stories of how private equity is really like you know messes up the business and things like that i think for us we were on really a hunt for company that actually loved our product was equally passionate about our product they were consumers of the brand um they had the same vision for the company as we uh, had they were ambitious but still patient uh, because we were never going to be that company that the minute we got private equity we would just uh, spend it all roll out just hundreds, roll out yeah. like a hundred things without yeah. caring about the product without ensuring that you know the quality is consistent and uh, you know also we are a company that makes classic products you know so they didn't want to suddenly change the core product of the company you know so these were all aspects that we had considered you know when we were looking out for private equity and i'm i'm really so happy to say that genuinely in our case it has worked out uh, so well where we have really found true partners in our private equity did you turn uh, down anybody <laughs> when before you found the right partner yes <laughs> many many uh, Did you get turned down by people? Yes, also absolutely. And what was that like? Like, was uh, that a very difficult thing to deal no, with? No, it wasn't because uh, we understood that we were not a very big, we were a very small company when we looked at private equity. You know, twenty stores is not that big for a private equity. So we did also we went to funds that were quite large in nature, and were used to dealing with. much bigger company so we did get turned down by uh, a lot of companies there were also companies that didn't give us a true valuation at that point of time so you know it, it kind of got sifted out a lot of it got sifted out but i think with our private equity partners i say say ventures they're really honest upfront with us and uh, they give us a valuation we deserved at that point of time and also really genuinely believed in the company and the product and uh, you know i think 5 uh, years on they're still you know our partners and wow. we, i'm ever so thankful for that because that's interesting because a lot of times you think with private equity they have a three year exit strategy and yeah. you know then um, well all and, private equity has an yeah. exit strategy and they should that's how they function <laughs> but uh, you know it's uh, we understand that very clearly and they've also made us understand that the agreement but whatever time we have had with them and continue to have it's it's been a good partnership that's uh-huh. amazing uh-huh. and is it still just them have you kind of gone yeah, beyond that yes just them no wow. it's just them that's great um let's talk about building a brand right uh-huh. because 
as much as sort of product and scale is is one aspect of it, I think what people love about Theobroma is also Theobroma, the brand, right? And how sort of, I mean, we'll talk about you and your personal brand because I think everyone still sees you very much as the face of the brand. But, you know, Theobroma has also become bigger than just you. How sort of has that transition been for you from going to, you know, kind of is Theobroma to now sort of Theobroma becoming a entity in itself? And, you know, a lot of people love the product, but may never, you know, heard of you or even know you. I'm uh, so grateful because, for that. Honestly, yeah. I think it's lovely that, uh, you know, I mean, in the initial days, uh, I think, as you said, Kainas and Theobroma were sort of, uh, you know, the same. But over time, the brand has uh, grown into its own. It's been able to stand on its own two feet. And, and you know, it makes me really happy to actually hear that, uh, you know, Theobroma is known without Kainas. Because that is and was always the aim. I'm inherently not a person that that loves social media and likes to put myself out there. So. As it happened, when we started, I became the face of the brand. You know, I was not the only one that built this brand. There were, you know, all the whole family chipped in and did a lot of hard work. My C, my first CEO, my second CEO, our private equity partners and all our employees. You know, it takes so many people to really to have uh, put in sure. uh, their hard work, blood, sweat, tears to actually build what we are today. And uh, for a long time, because I was the face of the brand, I had to, you know, give a lot of media interviews, take whatever media interviews came our way, um, talk about the brand, talk about aspects of the brand uh, that I was not necessarily doing, but I had to talk about it. Um, And, uh, you know, uh, it, it wasn't something that I genuinely was pleased to do I'm, I'm happiest in my kitchen doing you know baking something but I had to do it and uh, would you now, say that it's today, important for the personal brand to build alongside the the business brand well it depends on what the business needs because uh, you know if if your own personal aspiration is to build your personal brand as well that's great please go ahead and do it but uh, for me, it was not the case. I was not, uh, you know, really, I'm still not really interested in that. Uh, and the fact that today Theobroma can stand on its own, I feel like a proud parent, yeah. honestly. Uh, you know, uh, you know, child's off to college. <laughs> <laughs> I have an emptiness, that kind of feeling. But uh, um, I'm, I'm happy that it's stand, standing on its own. And that's what I wanted in any case. So. Of course. I mean, I think you've done an incredible job with that. You know, one of the dilemmas that we go through, and you talked a little bit about this, that the product is so important and finding, you know, your your investor who believed in your product, loved your product was also so important. And it is a, you know, it's that comfort classic that everyone sort of knows it's familiar. Um, you know, it's been 18 years and you still taste the same thing. So, one of the challenges that we face, and of course, again, this is on a on a much smaller scale, is that, you know, what is that classic that people always associate your brand with and, you know, come back to you for like over and over again versus sort of constantly creating new things as well to keep people engaged and interested, right? And how has the menu, since you're the creative director of the brand, like how has the menu evolved over the years? Like how do you decide what percentage to keep um, with old favorites and how much to, you know, keep creating? So this is actually something I've struggled with since we started because, uh, you know, when we were a small business, when we started, everything on the menu was something I personally loved and would make only that. But as we grew, we started putting in things that the guests loved as well. But, you know, it was really hard to take off things because you had spent time, effort, you know, so many hours uh, deliberating what would work, what taste we should include, what taste we should remove and create this product. And then, you know, just at the flick of a hand to get it removed from the counter, it was a hard decision. Uh, but, you know, and over the years, we've always struggled with this. What should we take out? You know, it's getting repetitive. It's, you know, there are so many reasons to put on and take off a product. 
But I think um, what happened was I think my CEO has actually really taught me how inefficient and, you know, complete waste of everything uh, having too many products because as a person also I like variety so mm. I like to walk into my it's store and choice. see <laughs> yes and also see like completely full shelves mm. you know overflowing shelves I love that wastage wastage spoilage <laughs> yeah you know but ultimately yeah. it's food and uh, you know it's a lot of uh, profits yeah. down the drain so I think we've become much more disciplined as a company. Now, if we introduce something new on the menu, something has to go out. Uh, so, of course, there are your core products, uh, which you are known for, which people love and can eat every day. We keep those on the menu. And then we, uh, whatever new we take, we have to remove something from the menu. It, it's a very disciplined mm-hmm. science. And then... Uh, also, then the other aspect that we had to deal with was boredom, right? So if you have a product on for very long, people can get bored of that product if every time they enter your store, they see only that product. So then we started introducing things for f- the festive menu. We have rotational menus now where instead of sort of putting, making everything we, we do in one shot, we keep it on a rotation. And then, of course, we also have, uh, uh, you know, for every small festival, we introduce something. So that way, the staff also keeps getting motivated to make something new and exciting. And as well as, uh, you know, it gives the, our guests something to come back for, something to look forward to, uh, something to try, which is new and different from the regular menu as well. So how much of your time goes in R&D versus just overseeing production. So now I think I'm very lucky that we've reached a stage where, uh, you know, I've been able to build out a team that looks at production, daily production. So I don't look at that at all. And um, I'm also uh, in the process of building out uh, a team that will help become the future thinkers of the product. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I'm really grateful that my uh, because my CEO does everything else, I'm able to focus on the one small aspect that, uh, you know, how important it's a small aspect to be able to help create the products. The you new know, products. New yeah. products. And uh, a friend of mine once told me the best businesses are the ones where the creator is made redundant. <laughs> the best run businesses. And um, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth in that, actually. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think I'm trying to just spend more time in in the studio and less time. And I'm just kidding. But, you know, I think it is, yeah, Yeah. it is, it is important to, uh, to let go, but at the same time, not just let go to the the, the ether, but let go to a team that's been groomed and will make mistakes no doubt but will you know learn and, yeah, let, let and them uh, make their mistakes, be empowered but yeah. at the same time you're you know you're around if they need you and yeah. then that's it you know so uh, I have a very small role in the company now <laughs> and uh, quite happy for that yeah so you know I remember this I remember when your store opened um, just off Pedder Road mm-hmm. I, I can't remember which year it was in, but I was so excited because now I didn't have to like wait till we went to Colaba for anything. It was, you know, a hop, skip and a jump from uh, from home. But also, more importantly, I remember that that's when you went with, um, you know, the pastel colors and you sort of really changed the branding. Uh, we sort of ventured into retail, you know, less than a year ago for the first time in terms of a physical retail space for our, our breads. And... Um, in order to do that, one of the things we really had to focus on was packaging, right? Like, because um, it's as much a representation of the product and, you know, in terms of, especially when it comes to delivery and things as in, you know, how something is, it's the first sort of glimpse of your brand, right? So, like I said, I remember when you went through this kind of rebranding, it was for me, because I remember those boxes with the lovely little drawing of the, of the Kulaba store, was that, yeah, uh, yeah? and uh you know, what led you to make this rebranding decision? Because that was quite a while ago. So it wasn't, you know, just that, oh, when you got funded and you decided now to go bigger and better or something. It was it was something you did pretty early on, as far as I remember. So what led to that uh, 
decision. So as you said, packaging is very important and it's possibly, you know, the first impression of your product. So when we started, we were very lucky that our product, uh, you know, the our guests accepted our product. Uh, as they were in whatever packaging we gave it was very inefficient packaging engineering and aesthetically it was it was quite bad because uh, you know we, we couldn't afford to get anybody and uh, you know and to do our packaging and also it wasn't uh, it, it, you know today there's a sort of an expectation uh, you know people initially used to come and only consume our product now our product is also giftable mm. so and it's because of our packaging and it's really thanks mm. to my lovely friend Elsie Nanji who really took a chance on me when we were really small uh, and uh, you know she really sort of changed the way we look at packaging it was also a mindset in those days nobody spent on packaging exactly uh, and uh, you know it was uh, you you had those plain cardboard b- boxes and if if you were really cool you had your logo on the card on sticker. A, on a sticker <laughs> right yeah. right it was never it was never something that people actually Less focused on yeah. And it was really thanks to Elsie where she not only designed because she knew me and she knew our brand and she sort of, uh, you know, combined our histories together and really created and gave our brand an identity, a consistency, uh, you know, something where people can recognize it from afar. And she did it all when we couldn't afford to pay her. You know, she did it all for just for me. And I'm really indebted to her for really defining our brand. Um, and then she moved on also to design our stores. So, uh, you know, it sort of extended and kind of gave us a theme, something to, uh, you know, and people started then gifting our product to other people. And that really helped also promote our brand, uh, grow our brand. So I'm deeply indebted yeah. to her for doing that for us. But um, I think that's the... And I think that is important. Yeah, uh, that's exactly. Today I mean, now there's a sort of a certain expectation when you get a Theobroma product in terms of the visual appeal, but also the packaging. Yeah. No, and, and, and I think that when you're looking at scale, that recall factor that, you know, you can see it from a distance and you know exactly what it is, is something that... You build not when you're hitting scale, but when you start out. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of us, like you said, don't, it's a big investment to to do that. And um, But it's an important investment. And also, I think, uh, you know, honestly, it's one of the best investments we've made. And it it took us a long while, uh, you know, to convince uh, my parents at that point of time. We were still having to convince my parents that we had to spend money on a box. Yeah. For them, it was that. But uh, because it was all intangible stuff at that time, I, we couldn't explain that it's going to, you know, give your brand an identity. And they were like, what? What is that? <laughs> you know? yeah. But I think it was all part of the, uh, I mean, it's money well spent. So 18 years, 100 stores. Um, is there anything you would have done differently in hindsight? I don't mean from a day-to-day basis, mm-hmm. but just the journey overall. I think uh, I would have recruited better if, uh, you know, for far too long, we sort of uh, did too many things ourselves, which we were not capable of, you know, just because in our head, we were telling, oh, we can't afford Mm. a marketing manager, we can't afford a CFO, we can't afford, you know, I don't know, a CEO at one point. So um, I think uh, there were many things that I would have done differently, but I think if there was something that had to stand out, it would be recruitment. I would put so much more effort than I did. So would you say investing in people earlier on, even though you maybe can't afford them? Because again, this is something that we went through very recently where, um, you know, we've had someone, sort of an HR person who was doing like day-to-day things. And now we're at a place where because we're growing, um, and we need to hire more people. We've realized that it's not just a it's not just a task that someone has to do with like onboarding and right. you know whatever setting up interviews and payroll and things. But it's really about someone who can go out and filter and find the right people and filter that process to align. You know, like you said, like you know, finding people who would be the right fit, right, yes. a better fit. 
Um, and we recently made a very big investment as far as, you know, again, we're concerned for the size of our business in HR. But it was just something that I now feel is so integral. I mean, people think we're an F&B business and it's about food and drinks, but it's actually about people. Absolutely. Um, and I'm feeling, you know, excited about that. So is that kind of what you would say that it may not feel like your business can afford it or is is big enough for it but that's a good investment to make early on yes you, you have to you have to of course be the payoff so I'm not saying you go and hire say the most expensive HR person yeah. in the world but uh, you have to hire the the level that is right for not only your business right now but for your immediate future as mm. well so what is the right person that will not only be able to handle or get your business right now, but will be able to take you from step three to step four and potentially to step right. five, right? Of course, over time, people do drop off and uh, they may either grow with you and be able to, you know, handle your scale or they may be able to you say, outgrow okay, I them yeah, they you will, outgrow yeah. them yeah. or they outgrow you yeah. either ways. So yeah. I think uh, it it definitely recruitment I would spend a lot more time on. Um, moving to something a little more personal, uh, Kainas, I know like you, like me rather, you yeah. have a young daughter. Um, and in fact, I learned very recently that you uh, went through multiple rounds of IVF mm -hmm. um, treatment. How, firstly, do you manage to find a balance um, between your baking empire <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, and and family time, uh, which I know you're very passionate about. Uh, but also, how was that process, you know, when you were going through that? And clearly, your business was at a sort of point of um, parallel mm -hmm. very exponential yeah, growth. It, right? it all came together, you know, when it rains, it really pours. So I think firstly, uh, after we got married, uh, you know, I, we had a sort of late marriage and so uh, we tried very uh, for a long time uh, naturally to to conceive we both wanted kids nehal and i were very sure you know before getting to, into a marriage that we both wanted kids and so we did uh, try but uh, of course uh, you know uh, because of my age and things I, we couldn't have a kid naturally so of course ibf was then the uh, you know next step and so it was a very painful time, honestly, a uh, very difficult time. But again, thanks to my CEO who supported me um, and gave me the space to, uh, you know, really indulge at that time. It was an indulgence because we didn't even have the size or the ability to have the kind of employees or the kind of team that we have today in our business. We were still a struggling small business at that point of time. And he did give me, you know, many months off to be able to focus on that. Not 100%, but, you know, at least for the most part of it, I was able to take time off, which I hadn't, was not able to do previously. And so that was like a big blessing. Uh, and then, of course, when, when we conceived, we were all, you know, very happy. And then I broke probably every pregnancy rule because we were also at that point of time, we had sort of launched a burger brand. So I was doing the trials whilst I was pregnant. So I was eating raw meat, blue cheese, oh shellfish God. every single day. <laughs> so it was, a, uh, you know, a crazy time, but uh, it was also very engaging and fulfilling time in terms of our business because seeing our business do well, seeing it grow, it was really nice. And then um, when Nina came along and, uh, you know, we actually, uh, she was there physically. <laughs> At that point, I really decided that I will, I'll try and not work weekends anymore. And so that really sort of became a big thing. So when we launched in Delhi, uh, I had, uh, Nina was just born. She was literally a few days old. And, uh, you know, Cyrus made sure that I didn't have to go to Delhi sure. for the launch. So um, for that, I'm very, very grateful that I had the luxury, literally, of taking some time off. And I had a good maternity leave. And then when I came back, uh, then it became about the juggling, <laughs> you know. So uh, what I have a very scheduled life now. Uh, so she now goes to school. So... 
generally I try and work around her working hours. So, you know, I try and be home, not when she comes back from school, but at least in the Soon evenings for, for meal times, for bedtime, weekends. And then whenever we can, we take uh, holiday, uh, holidays as a family. So that, you know, sort of makes me look forward to those uh, times together. I think the key mm, thing it's is a full discipline. life. Uh, yeah, it yeah. is. It is. It's a disciplined life. You know, it doesn't. Uh, you know, really give me too much room for much else. But it's a very fulfilling life. Yeah, I, it's still something I'm working on. And uh, I think I don't think it's a one-time thing. Yeah. You know, it's an everyday. There have been times, honestly, where work has taken precedence. Uh, there are times when Nina has been ill, and I've go, I had to go into work. It's happened. Uh, it, uh, you know, I can't just put up my hands and say, okay, uh, you know, I have a sick child. I'm not coming into work. But uh, I think, uh, you know, gets better, it gets okay. better. You get better at dealing with it, I think, rather than it getting better. Yeah, that's a good but, point. Uh, Has it changed anything in terms of your approach to women working for you? Absolutely, it has. Uh, you know, I've learned to be more empathetic to uh uh, to uh, women uh, and actually, uh, you know, uh, males because sure. we also give paternity leave right. now. Uh, it's not as much as maternity leave, obviously, but it is, uh, you know, you, you do get a paternity leave if you uh, work for us. So that's nice. And uh, as far as uh, women are concerned, yes, you know, you, you need to be able to balance. And plus, I think the pandemic has also, in a way, helped, uh, you know, giving a lot of flexi hours to people. So we are able to do that. People today can work from home if they are not in production. And so all that has really uh, genuinely helped us uh, create a more balanced life for our employees. They are still, of course, you can't take away the fact that you're going to have to work on all festivals and, you know, weekends are busy and things like that. But, uh, you know, yeah, it's baby steps. <laughs> Absolutely. Um. You know, I, I want to ask you sort of what your future plans look like um, in terms of growth and diversification. But before mm -hmm. I do, mm -hmm. um, you know, you mentioned about venturing into a burger brand, which I believe you've now uh, shut. shut. Yeah. Uh, what made you go from, you know, pastry and sweet to uh, savory in a way? In, in So when we were kids, my mom uh, was very you know, fond of uh, having burger parties uh, because in those days there were there was no continental food available in you know Bombay. It was uh, really I think uh, you know largely all restaurants were multi cuisine and heavily Indian and um, uh, you couldn't get much else. So she used to you know make burgers and at home and stuff. So I think it was always it was more really for her that we just started it. It was at a time when, you know, we had just got the investment. And so uh, we had a little more freedom. We were, we were not so big, but uh, what ha what we realized all of the time, at that time, it was a good brand. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, the brand did very well for the time that it was in existence. But I think uh, what we realized was it was taking us away from our core business. And so we uh, went, put a stop to it, uh, took a step back and said, no, let's just focus on, you know, uh, Theobroma because really it deserves that, our full attention. And so that's why we uh, shut the burger brand. But uh, quite happy to, uh, you know, explore have, that. Explore, time, yeah. yeah, maybe another time, yeah. not now. <laughs> So what what is the future of Theobroma look like right now? The future, well, we are in expansion mode, as you know. Uh, you know, we've just crossed uh, 100 stores. I think uh, uh, now we have to look forward to 200. Uh, that's the next step. And But, you know, all that part of the business, really, it doesn't interest me. It's <laughs> really for Wrong the answer. <laughs> really <laughs> for the, uh, you know, yeah. for my CEO to yeah. do all that. That's really his domain. Uh, you know, and Rishi is good at it. He's, uh, you know, that that's his speciality. But for me, that means for me is that it's allowed me to focus on product quality and development, which is what I'm fond of doing. And uh, also it's, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
allowed me to create a more consistent product for our brand. And uh, I think I'm, I'm really grateful for that because not, not many entrepreneurs have that luxury, focus right? That. To focus on what they are good at mm-hmm. and solely focus on that, not get distracted by... Because if when you're an entrepreneur, you will know you have to do you everything. To do everything. Yeah. So I'm, I'm grateful that I have that so opportunity. So are we going to see <laughs> it in, when we travel internationally soon? <laughs> you know, there's so much uh, potential in India yeah. and, and I'm a big believer in the India story. You know, our country is just exploding in terms of opportunity. There is a demand for our products, Pan-India. We are slowly creating a Pan-India, you know, presence. And uh, honestly, that's where our focus lies uh, internationally. Maybe someday, but uh, not now. (laughs) Amazing. Well, hopefully it's not, uh, it'll be my airport stop, just (laughs) not just in Bombay, but everywhere. (laughs) Very Just soon. <laughs> um, so we're going to take a quick break before mm-hmm. we enter the last segment of the show, which is more fun and um, more playless work. So okay. we'll be right back. Done. So I am back with Kainaz Mesman and uh, we have been talking all things amazing Theobroma. But now I'm going to sort of ask you about all the non-Theobroma stuff. <laughs> um, what's your go-to comfort food? Chicken soup and rice. Oh. <laughs> um, at least you didn't say khichdi. That's what everybody <laughs> says. <laughs> um, a great hmm. book you've read or podcast you've heard if um, in the recent past. The Almanac of uh, Naval Ravi Kant oh, yeah, by Eric that. Jugensen. Yeah. It's a fabulous book. I mean, honestly, it's uh, my CA out of all people <laughs> gifted it to me. No, but he, he's, a, he's a great guy. But anyway, so he gifted me this book. And uh, what I found was it was I had never read a business book till, till then. But it was really um, a, a very practical sort of guide to wealth, to happiness, uh, to success. And uh, generally how to create a more, you know, full life, a more meaningful life. And I think... Uh, that really sort of spoke to me. So I was, uh, it's one of the, really one of the best books I've read. Amazing. What's the best investment you've made in your journey? In my health. I think, uh, you know, uh, as chefs, uh, generally, uh, you're prone to very bad health because, you know, you're working long hours, you're eating rubbish all the time in terms of, you know, you're not keeping meal times and you don't have time or the energy really to exercise. And I think, uh, uh, you know, taking that time out every day for myself, that one hour to either run or walk or swim or, you know, do yoga, whatever it is. I think that is really, really important because honestly, true wealth is your health, really, you know. So uh, just, uh, and I'm very happy that I have a family that supports that idea, you know. So if I'm lazy on one day also, Nihal will wake me up. He's like, come on, just let's go for a walk. Let's just get out. You know, if you don't want to run, let's just walk. So I think uh, that really uh, sort of uh, helps. Who've been your role models or mentors? So I think, uh, you know, the late Chef Coelho was uh, really one of, uh, you know, the mentors who really influenced me to a great, great uh, depth. Uh, I think he gave me my kitchen protocol. Uh, You know, very early on, he taught me to sort of master the basics, you know, and uh, forget everything else, like cut out all the other noise, just focus on your basics. And I think that that advice really, really has helped me in good stead because uh, if you master your basics, everything else, just you can pick up really quickly. But if you don't have a strong foundation, you have to approach each thing as a specialization and you can spend years uh, you know, doing something and not still not learning it very well. So I think uh, that was really good advice. And I think the other thing he really taught me well was to how to uh, sort of build a team. You know, he always told me, you don't need the best people to make a great team. You just need people to work well together. And that makes a great team. And uh, he is so right. So right. So, What's your definition of success? For me, uh, success really is a 
about uh, being able to have a balanced life. Uh, today, I have the luxury of doing work, doing meaningful work. But at the same time, I can take a holiday. You know, when my child has a holiday, I can exercise. I can, for me, that, that is success. You know, being able to live life on your terms. And that, that is important because, again, that is a luxury. Not, not every entrepreneur, not every person who has a job has that luxury. I agree. <laughs> and finally, uh, and very importantly, what is your advice to the large number of women bakers in the country who want to scale their business? So again, <laughs> firstly, as I said, firstly, you scale only if you want to scale. You don't have to scale because that is someone else's idea of success. So there is absolutely nothing wrong in having a lovely small business. So that is important. And I think uh, secondly, I think you should clearly define your ambition and have a goal and a plan to work towards it. It may not be necessarily carved in stone because plans change, life changes, circumstances change, but it will give you something to work towards. Um, and so that is important, I feel. And be realistic in your expectations. As I said, you know, before you open your first store, don't start thinking about private equity <laughs> investment and, you know, going to other cities and going internationally and this and that. Start, take baby steps. Be realistic of your expectation and your abilities. Um, that's important. And of course, work hard. And for me, personally, I think being good and honest in your business is very important because for me, my sleep is very important and I'm able to sleep. But if I can say I can sleep, I, I sleep well, for me, that is very, very important. So that's my advice to women or to anybody really who wants to start a business. That is great advice. Kainas, thank you so much for being on the show and I look forward to having you back on the 200 marker. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Gauri. Thank soon. you for having me on the show. Thank you. With a pinch of patience, a dollop of dedication and an ounce of optimism, Kainas Mesman Harchandrai has indeed the perfect ingredients for a successful homegrown business. If you enjoyed listening to her today and you want to know more about her journey, you must read her book called Baking a Dream, The Theobroma Story. And for those of you who also want to know more about IBF, uh, Kainas went through this, uh, as she mentioned, and there's a great episode between her and uh, Dr. Munjal Kapadia on his show called She Says She's Fine. It's truly worth listening to if you're going through it or, um, you know, would just like to know more about the IVF process. So I definitely recommend that. I hope you enjoyed tuning in today. Do catch the earlier episodes when you get a chance. And more importantly, I would love to hear from you with your thoughts on the show. You can find me on Instagram at Gauri Devideal or on Twitter at Gauri Details or LinkedIn. Either way, sit back and relax because this round is on me.